Hey everyone, it's Daniel. My clients often ask me about the best tricks for the SAT and ACT. I mentioned in a previous video, I don't quite know if I would call these tricks, I might opt for the word strategies. Still, it's important to note that the SAT and ACT are not like your high school tests. It doesn't matter how you get the answer, as long as you get it. So let's look at some great alternative approaches to questions. This is sort of like everything your high school teacher doesn't want you to do, but these are excellent strategies for approaching questions on a standardized test. And if you want to call them tricks, okay, fine. In this video, we'll focus on some math tricks. The next two videos will cover grammar and reading tricks. If you find any part of this video helpful, please comment down below, hit the like button, share, and subscribe. Be sure to also hit the notification bell so that you can be updated whenever I post a new video. I really appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, math tricks. Here we go. I covered this strategy in an earlier video, but it's worth hitting again because it really emphasizes the point, if you get stumped on old-fashioned algebra, there's often another way to look at a standardized test question. Let's give it a shot. Jordan is going on the cleanse diet. He stocks up on lemons and cayenne peppers. He goes to one of those fancy organic stores where lemons cost $3 each and peppers cost $2 each. If he bought four more lemons than peppers and spent a total of $42, how many lemons did he buy? This question could be done with algebra. You could set it up with a let statement or as a system of equations, but both of those approaches could be fairly challenging. So let's look at another way. In video number nine, we talked about how to use the answer choices to work backwards. On a standardized test, one of these answers has to be right. That means sooner or later, one of them has to give you $42. So you can test the answer choices, work backwards, and see which one gives you $42. Now, that might be a little time consuming, so there's definitely a choice you want to start with. Of the five choices, you want to start with B, as in boy. Why? Well, look at the answers for a moment. On a standardized test, the answers will always be listed in order, like here, 10 through 14. Let's think about what happens if you start with B. If you were to plug in B, do a whole lot of math, and get $42, it means you're done. But if you were to plug in B and get something higher than 42, that means not only is B wrong, it means the answer would automatically have to be A. If it's A or B, you get it in one shot. Now let's think about it the other way. You test B and you get something less than 42. That means A and B are automatically out. They're too small. Now you're left with C, D, and E you would now test D, as in dog. Why? Well, think about it. If 13 gives you what you want, $42, it's the answer. But if D is already too high, that means the answer must now be C. And if the answer is too low, that means it must be E. So of the five choices, you only need to test two. This is a great alternative on the SAT and ACT. It could help save you time, and it could also help you approach a question that you can't otherwise do with algebra. So give it a shot. Test choice B, press pause, and see what happens. So assuming that the answer is B, that means 11 would represent the lemons. And remember, there are four more lemons than peppers. 11 lemons mean we have seven peppers. So testing that would be 11 lemons times $3 each, plus seven peppers times $2 each, and we want that to equal 42. Working that out would be 33 plus 14 is 42, so 47 equals 42. Not only is B not the answer, but we got a number that was too high. We wanted 42, but we got 47. That means B is too high, so the answer must be A. You don't even have to test it. Here's another variation of a cheating strategy that we've touched on before. Bill has a copper cylinder. What will happen to the volume of the cylinder if he doubles the radius? In a previous video, we talked about how you can pick your own numbers to make abstract ideas more concrete. So I'll give you that hint before we start. I'll also give you the formula for volume. They give it to you on the reference table anyway for the SAT. Volume is pi r squared times the height. Pick a number for the radius. Press pause. Watch what happens. Let's let the radius equal 2. That keeps the numbers fairly easy. So if volume equals pi r squared times the height, plugging that in would give us pi 2 squared times the height, or pi times 4 h, or 4 pi h. If the radius was 2, we got a volume of 4 pi h. Now they tell us that we're going to double the radius. 
So going from a radius of 2, we would now try a radius of 4. Plug that in, watch what happens. Pi r squared times the height would now give us pi times 4 squared h. Pi times 16 h, or 16 pi h. Notice what happened. When we doubled the radius, we did not double the volume. We went from 4 pi h to 16 pi h. So doubling the radius actually made the volume increase by a factor of 4. The answer is c. This brings up an important point from the SAT and ACT. Terms won't always have a linear relationship. In other words, just because you double one thing doesn't automatically mean that you double another thing. This is especially true with measurements like area and volume. So a great trick around this is to pick numbers. Picking numbers is a great way to sidestep complicated algebra or abstract thinking. Let's look at another variation where picking numbers is a great tool. Which equation matches the following graph? Just like the last question, you can pick numbers. And look at the graph. They're telling you what numbers you could pick. In other words, look at that point 1, 6. That means you could take the equations and plug in 1 for x and 6 for y and see which equation will work out to be true. Press pause. Give it a shot. If you were to plug in every choice here, you would see that only b works for the coordinate 1, 6. Let's prove it. Using the equation in b, y equals x plus 1 squared plus 2, let's plug in that point. 6 equals 1 plus 1 squared plus 2. Now following the order of operations, we would get 6 equals 2 squared plus 2. 6 equals 4 plus 2, and 6 equals 6. That's a true statement. The answer is b. Plugging in numbers is a great way to see what graph matches a given equation, function, or table of values. Using the answers can often help you avoid complicated math. Let's look at another. Which of the following is the equation of this graph? This question looks a little scary, and I'm sure there's a fancy math way to approach this question. And I'm going to be honest, I have no idea what it is. So let's try another approach. When you factor a trinomial, think about how you move from the factors to the roots. For example, if you factored a trinomial to be something like this, x minus 5 times x plus 7 is 0, you would get the answers by setting each part equal to 0. x would be 5, and x equals negative 7. So this question wants us to go the other way. Notice how the graph is intercepting the x-axis at negative 1 and 2. That means we can go backwards, so to speak. If x was negative 1, it means the factor at the step before that was x plus 1. Likewise, if x is hitting the graph at 2, it means the factor at the step before that would be x minus 2. Just looking at the picture, you can determine that our answers have to have x plus 1 and x minus 2. That eliminates a and b. Now let's talk about how to narrow it down between c and d. Look at what happens at the roots of negative 1 and 2. At negative 1, the graph is bouncing off the axis, so to speak. It reflects off the axis, but it doesn't cross over it. At 2, the opposite happens. The graph goes from a negative y value and then crosses the x-axis into a positive y value. That means something about the powers. If a graph bounces off of a root, the power is even. If the graph crosses over the axis, that means that the power is odd. So think about what that means of c and d. It means c is the only one that works. At the root of negative 1, the power is 2. That means at that point, it will bounce off the axis. Same thing with that root of 2, or x minus 2. There's no number there. That means that the power was technically 1. That's an odd power. That means at that root, the graph will cross over the axis. So again, who cares about fancy math? If you just know your principles of roots, factors, and powers, you're able to get the answer anyway. Let's look at another question where you could use the answers to avoid complicated math. In the triangle above, D measures 58 degrees and H measures 33 degrees. Come up with an expression to solve for DH. First, let's talk about the law of cosines. I don't mind that I'm telling you it because the test will also give you that formula. They give that to you if a question wants you to use the law of cosines. The law of cosines says this. A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cos A. That might look like a lot of junk to you, so let's just unpack that a bit. When they give you the law of cosines, or the law of sines, 
a little letter means a side, and the big letter means the angle that it corresponds to. So for example here, when they say little a squared, it means the side a, and then at the end of the formula, when they say cos of big A, that means angle A, or the angle that corresponds to that side. So just knowing that they're giving you the law of cosines means that's the formula that's in play. So right away you could knock out D and E. They're sort of telling you that's the formula they want you to use. Now we're left with A, B, and C. Now what? Well, let's work with those angle measurements a little bit. They tell us that D is 58. Let's label that. Also, H is 33. Let's label that. And knowing that a triangle adds to 180 degrees, it means the missing angle E is 89. So now let's think about the law of cosines. You always set it equal to the side that you want. We want DH, and DH is across from E, or 89. That means that the funky formula is going to have something to do with the cosine of 89. That means that the answer is C. So in dealing with the law of cosines, or the law of sines, you can often avoid complicated math. Just knowing what side you want and the angle that corresponds to it tells you what's in play, so to speak. It's not always enough to get the answer, but it is often enough to knock out at least two, if not three, of the wrong answers. Let's try one more. If the cosine of theta is one half, what is the sine of theta? There is a very complicated math way of approaching this question with something called reference triangles. However, that involves some serious trigonometry, and many of my students have never learned that before. So let's see if we could sidestep that. Let's talk about the three trig ratios, sine, cosine, and tangent. Remember SOHCAHTOA. They tell us that the cosine of the angle is 1 over 2. That means the adjacent over the hypotenuse is 1 over 2. That tells us that the hypotenuse has to be 2. And now the question is asking for the sine of the angle. The sine ratio is opposite over hypotenuse. Let's not worry about the opposite yet, but we know that that hypotenuse has to be 2. That information alone tells us that we could knock out D. So now we're down to A, B, and C. Now what? In your trig class, you might have learned the little mnemonic device ASTC. What does that mean? In quadrant 1, A means all values are positive, sine, cosine, and tangent. In quadrant 2, S, sine is positive. In quadrant 3, the tangent is positive, and in quadrant 4, the C, cosine is positive. A, S, T, C. I've heard different mnemonic devices for this. Students from one high school tell me they've heard all-star trig class, and others told me all students take calculus. Whatever works for you is fine, but that's a great mnemonic device to see where things are positive and negative in each quadrant. So this question wants to know the sine of the angle. And look at your theta. It's going all the way into quadrant 4. What do we know about quadrant 4? Following ASTC, it means only the cosine value is positive. And they're asking for the sine value. That means we need to have a negative answer. That's enough to knock out B and C. The answer is A. Again, there are very fancy math ways to approach this question, but who cares? Just knowing ASTC and just knowing that the hypotenuse was 2 was enough to get the answer. Now, can you always get the exact answer this way? Not necessarily, but it's often enough to knock out a couple of wrong answers. Let's look at one more great test-taking trick. We saw this introductory concept in a previous video, but now we'll kick it up a notch. Let's just repeat the basics first. The letters METFAN will repeat in that order forever. Which letter will be the 411th term in the sequence? Remember, they don't want you to sit there 411 times. They want you to see if a pattern emerges. So let's count and watch what happens. If we were to count, we would get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and so on. That means the N will always land on a multiple of 6. You could jump down the line to any multiple of 6 that you want, and it will always land on N. So let's think about that with 411. You can figure out on your calculator that 408 is the closest multiple of 6. That means that n would have to land on 408 since that's a multiple. And then from there, just count. m would be 409, e would be 410, and t would be 411. The answer is t. The ACT really likes the concept of a repeating sequence and jumping to a multiple. Let's see how it comes up in other variations. In the repeating decimal, 0.73962, what is the 283rd digit after the decimal point? Press pause, give it a shot. 
That bar over the decimal means that those numbers will repeat forever. So that two is in the fifth spot. That means that the digit two would always land on the multiple of five. So if we go to 283, we can go to the closest multiple of five, which is 280. That means that the two would have to land on the 280th digit. And then we could just keep counting. 281 would be seven, 282 would be the three, so 283 would be the nine. The answer is nine. Let's try another. What is the digit in the ones place of three to the power of 57? Now they are purposefully giving you a number that will be huge. It's far too large for your calculator. So I'll give you a little help starting this one. We're not gonna go three all the way to 57. That would take quite a while. But let's see if a pattern emerges with powers of three. Three to the one would be three. Three squared would be nine. Three cubed would be 27 and three to the fourth would be 81. And then from there, three to the fifth would be 243. Look at what happens. The cycle is starting again. This is going to repeat by cycles of four. The last digit will keep following the cycle, three, nine, seven, one, and that will repeat forever. So now that I've given you that hint, give it a shot. So in terms of 57, we need to find the closest multiple of four. That would be 56. That means three to the power of 56 would land on that fourth spot where the final digit is a one. 57 would be one more than that. That would bring us back to the first spot. It means that the ones digit is now three. The answer is B. Let's try one more. What is I to the 115? Now I'll help this with cycles of imaginary numbers in case you've never learned that before. Imaginary numbers will always follow this cycle. I to the one is I, I squared is negative one, i cubed is negative i, and i to the fourth is one. That cycle will repeat forever. So now, press pause, give it a try. Remember, that final term will always land on the multiple of four. So in terms of 115, we want to find the closest multiple of four. That would be 112. i to the power of 112 would land on that multiple of four spot. And then after 112, there are three left to get to 115. With a remainder of three, it means we're dealing with i cubed or negative i. The answer is negative i. Notice for the last few questions, they don't want you sitting there for 10 minutes counting 115 terms or 411 terms. There are faster ways into these questions. I hope you found these strategies or tricks helpful. These are all very popular types of questions that appear on the SAT and ACT. See how many you're able to spot on practice sections, which will really pay off on test day. And check out my next video where I'll cover some great grammar tricks as well. I'll see you there. And remember, plan your work, work your plan.